Okay, so it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce all of you, to, uh, to welcome all of you uh, to uh, what it is now the tenth topic in our program. Some of you may be surprised that suddenly, after being in the uh, world of the 19, early 1920s, uh, and now we're suddenly in the 1990s uh, and even 2000s, but the course has been constructed, as a lot of you know, uh, on the basis of when people were able to come and join us. And so it's not an attempt at a historical a presentation of the topic, which, uh, which would be difficult anyway in a semester or more. So the topic is, uh, and in quotation marks, 21st century socialism in the Andean Republic. I don't think one would consider Argentina part of the and the Republic, one would, okay. So, and then Argentina, of course, fit, fits in as well. This particular topic, though, comes at the 10th session. It actually joins what uh, we did in the very first session when we looked at the relationship of populism and socialism, obviously, that as even in terms of the readings, you can see that is the, uh, the overarching topic uh, for, for what we are, we are doing. And I'm really very, very happy to welcome the two, the two speakers, uh, Sol Montero, who is a research, research and professor at the University of San Martin in, uh, in Buenos Aires, and who is the author of two books, but only one that you give me here, The Uses of Memory in Kirchnerist uh, Discourse, which obviously belongs to the topic. And our other speaker, uh, my colleague for, well, you were here at least 10 years, right? More. More than 10 years. I mean, I've been here for 40, but you know, almost no one can compete with me. 14. 14. 44. 14. One four. You're 14. Yes. Well, that's pretty good already. Anyway, Federico is author at least of four books that I know of, but I just mentioned one, The Ideological Origins of the Dirty War, Fascism, Populism, and Dictatorship in 20th Century Argentina. It wasn't, I wasn't planning it this way, but they are born Argentine, both speakers, and of course Argentina is uh, is the uh, uh, is one of the places where what you call uh, modern populism uh, or contemporary populism uh, makes uh, uh, its its first first appearance. Uh, of course, that makes it difficult to decide who should go first. But it seems to me that uh, uh, that since your your uh, the things you submitted have to do with more recent cases, uh, many of Venezuela and, and Bolivia, and your work is primarily in Argentina. Uh, let's all go first. Argentina comes first historically, and you say, unless you want to, no, 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 I, unless I, you want to switch, I want to listen to. You me. can also switch. <laughs> no, no, so yeah, of course, the problem for the second person is that you feel like commenting on the first. Well, that's, <laughs> I, I like but it. that's okay. I mean, yeah, that's okay. we'll have a discussion. And I, I really look, uh, I look forward to it. So what about 20, 25 minutes each of you? And then uh, uh, maybe I will say something for five, uh, maximum 10, and then we'll have an open discussion. Okay? So, so and it's, it is being taped, so, so you're now speaking for, for the whole world, to the whole world. <laughs> Broadcasting. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, I'm going to talk about Kirchnerism, which is um, the government which is now in power in Argentina and has been in power for the last at least 15 years. So, uh, in this course we are dealing with socialism, but I will uh, put my attention in the Argentinian version of socialism and we will discuss if it can be called uh, socialism, but um, uh, I'm going to talk about Peronismo in its most recent form, which is Kirchnerism, as I said. You may be astonished, maybe, to know that in Argentina, socialism is a very minoritarian party. The Socialist Party is very minoritarian. Um, it is associated to moderated liberal social democracy, always opposed to Peronismo because of its rich <coughs> personalism and anti-liberalism. Uh, they, we have also some leftist parties, uh, which are mainly Trotskyists, uh, who hold most extreme positions, but are also very minoritarian. 
So the force that has developed a leftist agenda in Argentina is Peronismo. But as a political party, the Partido Peronista, it coexists with rightist or right-wing actors and tendencies. Uh, however, in general, we can say that there is a left Peronism that has fulfilled most of the left claims and symbols. So, left populism is our version of socialism. The starting point of my presentation is Arato's distinction between populism as a regime, as a government, and as a, uh, as a movement. Uh, Arato says in, in he, the text that uh, he gave for reading, it is very useful, he says, to further distinguish populism as a movement, as a government, and as a regime, even if these distinctions can lead to very different politics and poli policies. For example, democratic competition, public debate, and the plurality of civil society are presupposed by populist movements, but are almost always limited by populist governments and, and are invariably so, suppressed by populist regimes. So by examining the Argentine case of populist governments, the ones of Nestor and Cristina Kirchner between 2003 and 2015, I will try to discuss the problem of the democratic or anti-democratic nature of populism and to raise the question whether populism should be considered a political regime in itself. It is a subtype of democracy. Is there any specific feature of populism that may allow us to conceive it as a separate regime? In what meaning of political regime can we claim that? Finally, what relationship exists between the leftist character of Kirchner populism and its democratic or non-democratic vein? So, uh, I'll start with a description of uh, uh, Kirchner, Kirchnerist, Kirchnerist populism. Um, so, as you may know, the, because of the readings, the three administrations of the Kirchner deployed over 12 consecutive years, between 2003 and 2015, as I said, and generated an important divide in journalism and academia regarding its political legacy. Its supporters consider that it is a new version of classical Peronism in the 40s, because it successfully set into motion a virtuous model of growth and social inflation. Uh, from this perspective, the one of the supporters, I would say that it was a populist government, but in the good sense of the word meaning that Kirchner's populism is a higher stage of democracy itself. Its detractors instead consider the period as a populist regression, uh, in the words of uh, Echementa of uh, Peruzzotti, who's an author uh, who talks about this. Uh, so it's considered by its um, detractors as a populist regression characterized by, by an economic mismanagement, excessive redistribution, high levels of corruption and presidential authoritarianism. That is, they consider it a non-democratic government or at least a low-quality democracy. Both detractors and supporters agree, however, on the fact that Kirchnerism and populism are related. So, for, for, some, for some authors, as Perusotti or Echemendi and Garay, Kirchnerism cannot be strictly classified as populism. The latter classify uh, the Kirchner government as the left, even though their political party, the Peronist the Partido Justicialista, is not. So they say that the left turn in Argentina was supported by a populist machine, the Partido Justicialista, which was able to form a broader left-wing policy coalition. Populism, populism is here thus strictly associated to a party machine. In fact, they define it, following Levitsky and Roberts, as a type of leadership and mobilization. It is a top-down political mobilization of mass constituencies by personalistic leaders who challenge established political or economic elites on behalf of the people. That's the definition of uh, populism by Levitsky and Roberts. Uh, these authors claimed that Kirchnerism was a leftist government because it conflicted international creditors and the, and the Catholic Church and repeatedly clashed with large oil companies and rural business interests because they clearly prioritized economic growth over inflation control and they renationalized the pension system. Moreover, they established, they say, 
solid alliances with popular actors such as mainstream unions, unemployed workers organization and social movements and they promoted a series of trials of the military accused of human rights violation during the dictatorship. At the same time, they ran fiscal surpluses, established a good relationship with the National Industry Association and were un unwilling to roll back the major privatizations carried out during the 90s. They emphasized also that Kirchnerism was democratic, and I quote, Despite heightened political polarization triggered by the Kirchner's left turn, the political regime remained democratic. Elections were free and fair, there was no repression of social protests or serious attacks on the media or the judiciary, and after the conflict with rural producers in 2008, Congress became a decisive arena of policy making and government accountability. Finally, the Kirchner's made no unilateral effort to rewrite the Constitution, say Echemendi and Garay. I'm talking about the text that I gave you to, for, for readings. <coughs> um, regarding Barros and Kasusha Nostrigi's uh, perspective, they claim that Kirchnerism was at the same time populist and democratic. Ostigi and Kasusha drew a line in 2008 and identified two periods by observing the way in which Kirchnerism dealt with the inclusion, exclusion of the adversary. So from 2003 to 2008, President Mr. Kirchner, they say, directed the antagonism upwards but also outside, in the direction of the financial foreign connected sectors. In 2008, Christina Kirchner's government tried to increase the tax rates, the tax rates for soybeans exports and an opposition movement erupted suddenly. Soybean exporters, agricultural producers, urban middle classes and the owners of the biggest two media conglomerates of the country became united against, against that measure. In response, Christina Kirchner switched the direction of antagonism from the outside to the domestic scene. That's the argument of Kasusha and Ostigi from foreign financial sectors to the old farm oligarchy, urban upper middle classes, and especially the media. Paradoxically, the new internal antagonism that moved the populist frontier to the inside resulted in an attempt to expand the ass of Kirchnerism by bringing in more subaltern actors, such as the LGBT movement, the unemployed or informally employed families, and migrant sectors. This by uh, a lot of laws who um, were um, favorable to those sectors. So the populist moment of Kirchnerismo would start in 2008 when the adversary becomes internal and when the equivalence chain of adversaries is thickened and enlarged. Following Conovan, the Ostigi and Kasusha claim that populism is about appeals and that it is based on particular ways of drawing political frontiers. The people, the nation, our people, or the common ordinary people opposed to the social elite or the establishment. So populism is, for them, a particular way of including, excluding the adversary and it does not want the elimination of the, of the other. Barros, on the other hand, <coughs> It defines populism as a discourse of inclusion as of a part that was not articulated as a part following Rancière, and that is, and that in the including process breaks with the existing institutionalized discourse, so that it opens the field of representation and radically includes that part in a chain of equivalence. Barros' argument is that Kirchner was caught between populist and leftist discourses and that he had an aggressive discursive strategy in the attempt to articulate an identity around a certain uh, left of center signifiers. Nestor Kirchner, uh, for Barros, disrupted previous meanings and uses of politics, his discourse on justice and inclusion being presented as the discourse of national unity. So in his view, the Kirchner's populist and leftist discourse is not in collision with democracy. On the contrary, populism would be a form or a way of radical democracy.
Finally, I will quote uh, a text of uh, Federico, <coughs> which was published in Constellation. <coughs> Federico includes Kirchnerism, Kirchnerism in a long-term path of populist tradition, incarnating a neoclassic populism of the left faith, and he clearly distinguishes it from democracy. In fact, he sometimes considers it a political regime in itself, close or with origins in uh, fascism. He says, I, I, I will quote, throughout his, its long history, Peronism has refused to engage in a search for programmatic closure. This was a central facet of its populist ideology. Peronism as a movement, as a regime, and more so as a way of doing and understanding politics, has the ability to be in a state of constant reformulation, so that some politicians leave the political game, but Peronism remains with the same rich electoral machinery, perks and clientelistic relations to, with the electorate. This Peronist metamorphosis represents a floating nature of populism in its constant search for absolute majorities and total allegiances to vertical forms of leadership, and la last but not least, in its ability to challenge more emancipatory forms of democracy. Peronism is not fascism, but fascism represents a key dimension of its origins. The, that's the end of the quote. So as, as you see among the scholars, some classify populism as a political regime, some others as a type of leadership, government, movement or discourse. In general, those who defend the idea of populism as a variety of democracy do not specify why do they name it differently. Wouldn't we talk about democracy with adjectives? I mean, mass democracy, authoritarian democracy, delegative democracy, populist democracy. Should we give up on democracy, is it worth renouncing to that powerful name which was a hard conquer of our political community? On the other hand, those who treat it as a regime do not clarify in what specific sense it is different from democracy or from authoritarianism. If most of populisms are in institutional and procedural terms democratic, if they get to power through open elections and do not violate the fundamental democratic rights, how can we consider them out of democracy or non-democratic? <coughs> Not casually, many opponents to populism name it el régimen. El régimen chavista, el régimen de Chávez. That's, that's very, very um, usual in the press, for example. Or just el régimen, in order to disqualify it. Although they usually speak in a vague and non-technic sense of the term, I feel that what it, what it is at stake in, in this uh, way of naming it is a deeper and more fundamental political and discursive dispute concerning the nature of the political regime when populism is in power. I, I want to say that personally I feel a little uncomfortable sometimes when scholars talk about the populist regime because I don't want to disqualify governments that are democratic in the strict sense of the term. But even though I do have the feeling, and I think we all have the feeling or the intuition, that populism is not just a question of leadership or, or style. That there is a difference between democracy and populism as vital political experiences or as the imaginary significations that concern the ultimate goals of collective life in Castoriadis' term. And I think it is worth thinking why. So my proposal, I'm not going to develop it here, but I would like to think about this, is to rethink the category of political regime in itself. Because that notion can have, as you may know, in general terms, two different approaches. On the one hand, we have political scientists that stand for a narrow conception of a regime, conceived as, a, as the institutional features that regulate the access to power. <coughs> so from that point of view, we cannot strictly distinguish democracy from populism most of the times, unless populism becomes too authoritarian and disrespect the minimal rules of the oligarchy's institutional superstructure. But on the other hand, political philosophy, in the track of Montesquieu and Lefort, define political regime as a form of, of society, as a specific mood, which is also a principle of action in the terms of Montesquieu. So from this perspective, democracy and populism could be distinguished even if the institutional framework is similar in both regimes. So just to launch the debate, 
I would claim that there is a populist mood which makes us feel that there is a specificity of populism that even imposes a new term to name it because democracy doesn't seem to depict it fairly. We all have the feeling that there is something more, that there is a surplus when we listen to Trump or to Chavez. So where does that surplus lie? Uh, which, would, which would be the mood of populism in opposition to the democratic mood? <clears throat> so I think that the populist mood is negativity, reaction, anger. Piero Sambalon addresses negativity as one of the main expressions of the recent democratic mutation. When I talk about negativity, I'm not talking about the drawing of political frontiers which, or, or antagonism, which is inherent to the, the political itself. I am talking about the feeling of reaction and anger that make people search for certainties that allow them to get rid of democracy, for democracy's radical openness and uncertainty. Democracy is the political regime by excellence, by excellence, but it has lost its, its main pressure by becoming the government of oligarchy, global corporations and technocracies. So, <clears throat> from that point of view, the subject of populism wouldn't be a, sociolo a sociological unit, wouldn't be the marginalized or just the marginalized or the non-qualified, but the damaged. And it is very clear in Argentina where the populist moment can be located either in the beginnings of Kirchnerism, either in 2008 after the rural conflict, <clears throat> which were moments in which uh, people was really damaged and angry against the, the establishment. So I think that populism and democracy are about, are about how to deal with otherness, but mainly about how to channel and to conjure ang anger, rage and frustration. So ultimately, the final question is how can democracy recover its lost promise and restore its own mood based on openness, openness and contingency? So that's a more theoretical approach that I wanted to, to bring here, uh, and then we can discuss it uh, for the Kirchnerist case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, very good. Well, it's such a pleasure to be discussing this. Argentine things in such a in such, in such an Argentine context uh, as the new school. Uh, um, Three? How many Argentinians in the room? Do we count them? Yeah. Three. Oh, yes. yes, I think three. three. three and a half. Aside from the two of you, I'm counting four. I think. You're uh, counting four? Yes. Five. Five. If you if you we count you as an honorary Argentine. No, no, no. <laughs> I've only been there twice. <laughs> Uh, uh, many of us are there all the time uh, in terms of our minds. And, and, uh, so let me start with this. I mean, uh, first, I, I was a, a little bit um, uh, uneasy about talking about left, uh, left with populism in the context of, of socialism because to me uh, it, it is like a problematic. Uh, a problematic relationship in so far is, as it's part of a claim, meaning people that are populists claim to be socialist. And the question is whether should we, as historians or social scientists, take them at their word. I mean, after the Spanish Civil War, a couple of years after the Spanish Civil War, when you know hundreds of thousands were killed by the Franco dictatorship, culture was destroyed, most intellectuals were expelled. Uh, the opposition was either in prison, persecuted, or killed. Uh, Franco called for elections, uh, which he won. Uh, and these elections, by the way, had the outcome of, um, of uh, uh, certifying that he would be president for life. But he called them the most democratic elections in the history of Spain. Uh, now, of course, I don't take that lie, which is a fascist lie, at, uh, you know, in terms of what, I mean, at, at the war, meaning that, that that is true. I mean, I, I'm highly suspicious of that. Now, this is not to say that I, that I can compare Franco to Chavez, but when Chavez talked about socialism, I mean, I never thought that this was much of a, I mean, uh, this was much of a serious issue, but rather a claim. A claim by someone, by, by the way, was not really engaged in discussions about socialism before. Um, so, so basically, I wanted to, to put in a little bit, I mean, to put the, que the question in question, in a way, to question the question about populism and socialism, meaning there are populists that claim to be 
socialist, but I mean, I don't see much of, uh, of a connection. Uh, why? Because uh, what I think it is at the center of what populism is, which is uh, the idea of embodiment, the idea of personification, the idea that, uh, to use Orwellian, Orwellian language, that we need a big brother that, that basically drives the car for us and we sit in the back seat. And, and in a way, in parentheses, La Claus' proposal will be that if you have a right winger like Trump, or he was thinking of Berlusconi driving the car, let's choose the nice, good driver that is our big brother that will decide for us. I mean, and because he, that person will be progressive. And that person might call himself socialist, but socialism could be many things, but generally it doesn't relate very well uh, to the idea of impersonation. Because even in cases of, let's say, moments in which uh, social democracy, for example, was abandoned, and socialism uh, chose uh, to be real socialism, and it chose dictatorship, even that dictatorship was not done in the same sense of imperson personification and embodiment as it will be the case of fascism and populism. So my point is that the populism of the left already leaves behind, uh, in my view, uh, the socialist tradition by claiming full agency for the leader. I mean, this full identification between leader... I mean, and to me it's not a small thing that party is replaced with leader. I mean, it's not a small thing. And, and in a way, this new relationship between uh, the people and the leader, uh, I mean, new in the sense of the left, or, or, or people claiming to be on the left to choose that direction, basically leaves any possibility of socialism behind. In many ways, or at least in, in many ways in which, you know, the, the, the socialist tradition was uh, either performed or presented. So, it is true that, that sometimes uh, communists, and, and, and in the case of Argentina, uh, particularly once, particularly once uh, Peronism is toppled, will try to enter Peronism after 55 with the idea of making it uh, uh, you know, making it go uh, left, uh, leftward. But the implication is that they, they, they needed to accept uh, the leader as a sort of big brother, uh, as a sort of uh, person driving the car, uh, and in a way delivering full agency. Uh, some people actually which belong, for example, to left-wing uh, union sectors, they realized that mistake and, and, you know, they didn't have a pleasant time. They were in prison such as the founder of the Labour Party uh, that supported Perón in the first place, because they had to really uh, accept the idea that the leader knows best, that the leader is the one that decides. Now, the, po the, the proposal for a populism of the left then assures us that that leader in which we should uh, basically move, as in every populist situation, from representation to delegation, that, that leader will be one of the good ones, a good guy. Uh, but that implies already an article of faith. That already implies uh, uh, the politics of faith, I mean, a, politically, a political theology, in other words, rather than a more programmatic take on whatever source of rep uh, the question of representation uh, uh, relates us or not to particular leaders in politics. This is not the question about leaders and the socialist tradition, but rather a kind of embodiment which is typical of a new tradition, uh, in a way. A new tradition, at least, in the sense of coming to power. And that's one of my arguments in you know, in, in, you know in, in, in my last books, that, uh, that the, basically that is what happens with Peronism, that is the first populist that comes to power after 1945. Who was Peron? Peron was a dictator, Peron was a fascist. Peron, by the way, claimed to have been, claimed his military junta in which he was the strongman, he, present, he uh, like others, presented as a revolution, but at best it was a counter-revolution. And again, we should be careful with believing what they say, uh, or let's say take a, an uncritical look at it and, and we should focus on how this works which is the idea of politics, how populism operates particularly at the level of government uh, uh, and how decisions are made like I mean, again, it's a kind of it, it, it's, it's true that it's, uh, it, it can be chameleonic we can talk about populism of the left or populism of the right certainly we cannot talk about socialism of the right or fascism of the left so populism is something else uh, and, and, and that something else is uh, basically a form of democracy which is authoritarian, or let's say a form of democracy which is very different to uh, uh, more representational forms of democracy such as constitutional democracy. Uh, now, why? Because of a couple of things. As I said, the idea of personification, 
which is related to political theology, its messianism, and uh, the, its politics of naming. I will return to this in a, in a second. Then, the basically, the, the basic formula of populism, uh, the one and two of populism, which is something that also my colleague Androrato has presented, actually one of the best presentations in my view of how this works, because basically Andrew talks about how the, whole, the part becomes the whole, number one, and then the moment of impersonation or the moment of full embodiment in which that part of the people, which is already narrowed down, because let's say, who are the people? Let's, let's go back to basic. Who are the people? All of us. Populism confuses uh, the metaphor of a majority choosing for the people, deciding for the people, confuses that metaphor with a reality. Then that part, that tiny majority of people that voted for the leader are the people at large, become the people at large. Or as in the case of the US, which is very, very peculiar, it is the minority, because they didn't even win the popular vote, it is the minority that becomes the people. The rest of us, that's the problem of the, you know, the key intolerant problem of populism. The rest of us become the anti-people, or as Perón would say, the anti-pueblo, the anti-people, the, anti the enemies of the people, the anti-fatherland, meaning enemies and traitors of the people, which are now, in most cases, the majority, a tiny majority, sometimes 2%. Sometimes 2%. Only before the Syrian civil war, people like Assad will get like 90, 99% of the vote. And that is already an indication that that is not a democracy. In democracies, the people, as a metaphor, as the one that decides uh, in terms of uh, you know, an electoral decision, it's a tiny minority. That's why most politicians do not confuse that tiny minority with the people at large. Meaning, people that voted for you are not the people at large. All of us, in favor of you or in the position to you, are the people. That changes, and that's why Andrew says the part becomes the whole. Second element is the embodiment, because it's more restricted than that. Then the second mo movement, let's say, is when that part uh, that became the whole actually is further reduced into the leader, meaning the people and uh, the leader embodies the people, meaning not even that tiny majority or minorities in the case of the US make or have any meaningful connection with decisions that are made at the government level because those decisions are done only one by one person that embodies the people. So no need for a constant you know, a situation of representation. So, full delegation appears, the leader becomes, you know, a, in a way embodies a previous fascist or even going further, a, going further in time, monarchical traditions, and the leader is the people. Why? Well, again, as Andrew suggested, in a perfect uh, metaphor in my view, or a perfect way of presenting it, because the leader is us and is different to us. In a way, Andrew says, the leader is like the ideal people. Meaning, the leader represents what the people should be. That's why the people cannot be consulted. Because we are like a bastardized versions, in this idea, of what the leader is. So, we all eat fried chicken, we are told. But only one person can eat that fried chicken in his private plane. This is because we are told that we would like to do that. We would like to be billionaires like the leader. We would like, you know, this is another example that we discuss in my class, the, the key, I mean, in some, the, the issues of, you know, misogyny, which is typical in many populist movements. I mean, the leader told this country, the leader of this country, the Caudillo in the White House said that every single American would like to marry fashion models. Now, that implies already an idea of American men as being totally identified with him, and yet the difference is that he can do it. So, he says, I do what every American would like to do. And this idea, this project, projective idea, is of course, has a feedback, there is a feedback here by leaders and followers. Now, of course, are we assume, for example, as men living in this country, that we all would like to do or, or share the same desires as the leader? Of course not. But then we are not real Americans, because real Americans want to marry fashion models, as the leader tells us. I mean, and this happens again and again in different contexts. So the leader becomes the ideal people. And that's why, only the leader makes a decision. Now, there is a big distinction between, in my view, lately, as of late, because in a way, by reformulating itself in, the, in a democratic key, earlier populists, in a way, left many key elements of fascism behind. No embodiment, no this reduction of the people to the part, that they didn't leave behind. What they embrace is electoral politics, which of course are democratic and are not dictatorial or fascist, but they left behind two elements or three. I, I will mention two political violence and racism. 
that was out. And what they left behind them is a fascist notion of the people, which was an ethnos-based notion of the people. Who are the people in a democracy? The citizens. If we want to be more expansive, as I would like to, all people living in the country. Now, the fascists thought otherwise. It's not the citizens that are the people living in the, the people of the country, but people of a certain of a certain ethnic and religious background. That's why Jewish citizens were denationalized, a language by the way that is taken up by people like Miller in these days. Uh, they created an office within the Justice Department to denaturalize people. Uh, so the Nazis denaturalized actual citizens, for example, Jewish ones, um, and incorporate the people of ethnic, of, you know, uh, let's say, so-called Aryan, Christian, uh, slash white, uh, religious uh, and, and, and ethnic background from, let's say, Poland, Ukraine, perhaps Milwaukee, whatever, because it didn't matter who was a citizen. They had, as I said, an ethnos base of the people. What happens when populism comes to power after 45? A lot changes, because now they, 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 they embrace people like were dictators, like Perón, or Vargas, they embrace a demos-based notion of the people. Now, who are the people? The citizens. But who are the real people? Remember operation number one? The ones that support me. Meaning, the people are uh, basically, it's a reduced demos. Meaning, who are the people? It depends on your political opinion. Let's think, for example, about, uh, you know, uh, I'm Jewish, like the Argentine Jewish community in Argentina. There was an Argentine Jewish organization, the DAIA, which was an umbrella organization. But don't really went hard against that. Some people thought, as the Nazis did, but not really, because the Nazis destroyed, you know, Jewish life in Germany. What Peron did is destroy institutional Jewish life in order to do what? To create an Argentine Jewish Peronist organization. So the problem with that Jewish organization was not that it was Jewish, but rather that it was not Peronist. So the question is, you can be whatever you want, whatever you want, but you need to follow the principle of of embodiment. Meaning, in that context, then. It is an authoritarian notion of the people as demos, but it's not the people as ethnos, which was the fascist version. Now, let me, uh, how, many, how much time I have, because uh, some, somebody has been, in typical Argentine tradition, I have been just... Five, ten minutes. <laughs> okay, I will, I will try to take five minutes, uh, which in typical tradition, Argentine tradition would be ten. So, <laughs> take, 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 take the ten. Take the ten. No, 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 because then it becomes twenty. <laughs> no, I see what you mean. Uh, yeah. so, uh, take the three. I think the three. <laughs> so, what happens now? What happens now? What happens is that, I mean, previously, people on the right, the populists of the right, people populists of the left, they had important, of course, distinctions, of course. Economic, economically either regressive or inclusive politics and so on and so forth. But they share this demos notion of the people, a reduced notion, an authoritarian notion, but it's still a demos notion of the people. Who are the people for Berlusconi? Who are the people for Cristina Kirchner? The ones that follow them. The ones that agree with the idea that they are the true leaders of the nation. Now, something is changing as of recently, as of the last, let's say, 15 years. Uh, and that something is quite impersonated by the coalition in the White House. Because if you think about the way he launched his campaign, he launched his campaign with, by saying that uh, all Mexicans are rapists. And if you live in the U.S. for a couple of months, you will realize that when he talks about Mexicans, either by ignorance, by sheer ignorance, or on purpose, what he means by that is Hispanics. I mean, and this is something interesting. Sometimes in Latin America, people think, you know, in Argentina, oh, he's talking really bad, he's taking really hard views on the Mexicans. No, he's talking about you as well. He's talking about you as well. And this happened to our colleague and friend, Carlos de la Torre, whose son, I mean, they are as a family, they are from Ecuador, and who son, do you know what happened in the high school? I didn't know, no, no. Like uh, somebody interpreted, uh, Trump is interpreting his son and said to him, like, you guys should go back to Mexico. And he said, well, my family is from Ecuador. <laughs> and, uh, and the Trump is answered, uh, well, uh, I don't care which part of Mexico you are from. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, okay. I mean, true story, true story. Uh, of course, we should remember that Fox News is the same. So, you know, yeah. Guatemala was <laughs> Southwest Mexico or whatever. And all these countries in Central America were parts of different Mexicos. And that's what they mean. They, that's what they mean. But then, we, we, I mean, in, in, we did, in Italy with Salvini, we see the same. Um, and that's what we mean, what they mean. And what they mean by that is that then they are returning, I mean, insofar as something which was for Perón toxic. For Vargas, of course, the same, which was, you know, 
racism, it's not that he wasn't a racist. In his personal, who knows? I mean, his inner feelings. I mean, about Jews or about whatever. But in practice, he was not a racist. And actually, he thought that he called them piantavotos, the fascists and anti-Semites, or racists. And he actually said that, uh, that he regarded racism as toxic in politics. Once, uh, you know, he embraced democracy, he thought that this was no good for getting votes. So basically, I mean, like, like him, you know, from him to Berlusconi or from him to, to Chavez or whoever, uh, you know, you will see that they left uh, racism behind. But now with the new populists, we see a return, it's a mix. Because who is a, a, a person that is part of the people? Of course, a follower having a political opinion and voting for the leader, people as demos. But then, who is the base? Who are the base? Who are the real Italians? I mean, the ones that are of a, of an Italian, of a Christian and white ethnic background. The same might, you know, I mean, if you live here, you understand exactly what the president means by his base. He doesn't mean, you know, well, us in New York. He doesn't mean that. What he means, and this is very clear, I mean, if you, are, if you live in the U.S., what he means is, and this is very implicit, but it's a code that everybody knows, that uh, what he means is that people of a white and Christian background. So he has an idea of the real people also, which is based on the, on the ethnos, which is then, is it not fascism, because it's not only the ethnos, people that do not belong to that ethnicity or that uh, Christian background are not so far uh, denaturalized, as the Jews were in Germany, they, they continue to be citizens, but still, when they incorporate this ethnos-based notion of the people and they mix it with a demo, with a notion of the demos, we see something new. And that, in my view, is a big distinction between the populists on the right right now and the populists on the left. The, in a way, the, you know, the populists on the left are demo de, they are passé. They still remain like the other populists. Whereas now we see this return of something which used to be only fascist, not populist. And that's why we talk about, I mean, I talk about a, di a different thing. Now, I would like just to mention one, a couple of things about Argentina, because yeah, I, I was too general, right, right. because I mean, because Sol presented a more Ar Ar Argentine uh, uh, based uh, uh, explanation, so I didn't want to cross into that territory, but I will do it lightly, uh, I guess, I mean, the, the point is that, I mean, and this is the part in which it becomes a comment. I have some issues with understanding Peronism as the socialism of ancient inversion. That's what some people said. Historically, early Peronism was not socialist at all. It was anti-communist, was like a corporatist. I mean, it was much more... I mean, anyway, it was... I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it in the left. The, uh, what, it, what we call entrismo, that happened after 1955, people entering Peronism and, and trying to, you know, uh, to, to shape Peronism according to the left. By the way, the same happened with the fascists, and in this book, I, my chapter f uh, 5 is about that. Like, fascists also enter Peronism, they have been, they have not really been allowed to play an important role when Peronism was in power, and after 55, they also entered Peronism. And they also were pushing, you know, their own politics, and eventually there was a kind of Peronist civil war, if you will, uh, within the movement. By the way, with the leader choosing the extreme right, not the left. Uh, now, it's even more interesting in, in the case of Argentina because if you go back to, to, the, to the Peronist guerrilla traditions, the, you know, of the four, uh, four founding members of Montoneros, which was the left wing, the, the story is very messy because they did not enter Peronism from the left. Like eventually they were the Peronist left, but three out of four founding members entered Peronism through Taguara, which was a fascist organization. So they entered from the right. And the question is then, like in this tradition of the left, like one question that one could be asked is uh, what, what, what changed and what left? Because I would not call them then uh, right wingers. They were on the left, on the Peronist left. But when they talk about socialism with leadership and also they talk about uh, socialist Christianity, there is a lot of baggage in terms of fashion and history that I think we also need to take into account. Because I mean, this is a socialism that is not anti-clerical but the opposite, that embraces an, an idea of the nation, and I'm not talking about Argentina right now, but probably about many other countries in Latin America, embraces very conservative idea, uh, ideas of the nation, uh, which come from the world of corporatist Christianity, not the socialist left. I mean, uh, you know, uh, so this is, I mean, it's really interesting in that sense. Now, the Kirchner's, I mean, are, are, uh, I mean uh, it's a fascinating example, I think, because, I mean, let me start with the current president. We, you know, perhaps you also, it would be nice to hear your, your, your take on this also. The current president, let me tell you his trajectory. Uh, he started when he was a student, he was related to right-wing groups. 
Uh, then, when democracy came to the country, he became a, a radical, a member of the Alfonsin administration against the Peronists. He was against the Peronists. When then neoliberalism came to the country with the Menem Peronists, I mean, a, a neoliberal version of, of, uh, of uh, Peronism, he joined Menemism. He had a place in, in, with Menem. He was also working within the state. Uh, then, when Menem left, you know, there was a change. Eventually, he was like one of the key members of the Kirchner cabinet. So, from right to center left, to neoliberal right, now to Kirchnerism, Peronist left, he was uh, one of the key members of the, of the Peronist, of, of, the, of, of Kirchnerismo, and then, anyway, different things, critical, anti-critical, now, now he's the president. Gramsci would have said that that was an excellent example of transformismo in Argentina, we just call it Peronist. Because, you know, and you can apply the same model to the Kirchner themselves. Nestor Kirchner, as Beatriz Salvo showed in one of her books, like he was actually connected even to the, to the, to the neo-fascist groups uh, of Peronism uh, after 83 and before 83, and then eventually, at one point, they, they were closer, if a little bit critical, to Menem, but they were part of that, of the neoliberalism. And at some point, there is a kind of sudden change in which people that had, and, and you work with this, by the way, had no role in any kind of resistance at the time of the dictatorship, recreated a universal, a kind of metaphor of their government represented the, the left-wing uh, Peronist tradition that was actually persecuted by the dictatorship. And, and suddenly they, you know, from nothing to that, they, you know, they created this kind of signifier, whether empty or not is a big question. But the important thing, and this is how I would like to end, is that they fill it with environment, meaning that the leader is more than a name, it becomes everything. And in a way, Laclau, who was always talking about Peronism, finally found his example on the left. Because, I mean, the problem with Laclau and the previous model is that when he was talking about Peron before, the model applied but not the left. Now it was a left, a left version, and he radically embraced it. Uh, although Chantal Mouffe, in, in her recent work, doesn't talk about Latin America anymore. Like in, in Pagina 12, one, one uh, you know, uh, Kirchner newspaper in Argentina, she wrote an article saying, a couple of years ago, that uh, you look, Europe should, should look, should Latin Americanize itself in terms of the populist left. In, the, in her current proposal for a population of the left, basically there is no Latin America. Basically, with some exception. This is something that I mentioned in, in the text that you read. So the point is that what do we gain by, and this is the question that I ask now, by defeating uh, uh, right wing populists with uh, people that will drive the car with us, that they will not ask us any question or how we should participate, and actually they will name everything after themselves. Two more anecdotes and I finish. Like uh, once, which was, uh, I, was, I remember I was in Buenos Aires driving my car, no, not my car, my parents' car, uh, but I metaphorically, I was driving the car, and I, oh, and I turned on the radio and, a couple, and Christina Kirchner was president. And she was referring to the fact that she has been ill. And she said, you know, it was not really the, uh, uh, the normal illness, because, I mean, I was ill because I care so much about Argentines, that I kind of, like, I got ill, and Nestor, by the way, died because of the same reason, that like, we have so much stuff coming into our bodies that our, our bodies cannot handle it. And she said, and I quote, I am like a mother to all Argentines. Uh, and finally, her decision, and this is one of the key issues that that are difficult to discuss because they go against the grain of what Gramsci called an article of faith in the leader, uh, which is the issue of human rights. Mm -hmm. It was found, and this was not really fake news, because during uh, the trials, and even before, there were denunciations of this military man as being a, a, a participant in, in human rights violations during the Dirty War. I talk about this in my book on the Dirty War. Uh, and, uh, and basically, this uh, general, General Milani, I mean, an officer, a repressor, was named by Christina Kirchner the chief, uh, how do you say, the, 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 the chief of the joint, how do you say? Joint chief of the uh, top military general in the country, top army man in the country. And some people say, what's going on here? Like, I mean, this person has been accusing, let's say, in 84, before all this happened, like by, 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 by of having participated and even killing people, or having condoned or allowed the killing of, of people. And, and the best example of this was an article that I read, I mean, at the time, I think it was in another newspaper, an Argentine newspaper. It was the name, uh, the, the one that, that now is online. El Cohete y la Luna? No. The one of Berlusconi? No, there, there is one that it was a newspaper, now it's online. 
Tiempo argentino, thank you. So, in tiempo argentino, this organic intellectual of Kirchnerism, also he fashioned himself as an historian, but he's not. Um, but, but the point is, he said, I, if I read this critically, critically, I think I have no reason to support the President Cristina Kirchner in naming this person. Because I cannot understand why she does this. And, and any reason that I think of, I'm against this. But also I have faith in that she knows something that I don't know, and then she might be right. So I would like to finish there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, no more than 10 minutes, and that will be, oh, well, that will be an Austro-Hungarian 10 minutes. <laughs> Just 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't want to say Hungarian 10 minutes, because that would be a little bit closer to the Argentinian one. So, for a moment, even though I'm very anti monarchist and anti-Austrian with respect to Hungarian history, at least for the moment, uh, I think their sense of time is better to adopt. So three concepts uh, that we, uh, the two presentations uh, were around, actually each of you stressing a rather different one, uh, populism, which, which of course is there for both of you, socialism stressed here in a negative way, and democracy stressed there, and I want to address both of these. Now, I made the suggestion quite a while back, uh, actually stimulated by Federico's story about the fascist genealogy, but non-fascist nature of, of populism. Uh, uh, quite a while back, I, I argued that it has, has to have another root too. Uh, the other authoritarian regime of our time, namely state socialism, certainly seemed to me like an equal candidate for the, uh, for the genealogy of the, of the populist, uh, populist turn. Now this idea Federico contests and, and certainly didn't accept my own proposal around it. And I tend to think that he does it because he's such a good Argentinian. In Argentina he doesn't need it after all. The thing had a right-wing origin, a maintained right-wing elements. Uh, and in that sense, you could say, well, oh, the other stuff is window dressing or, uh, or additions uh, which uh, 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 were only to legitimate something that was not left wing, not the Argentine replacement of, of socialism. But if he's right for Argentina, I'm right for the rest of the world. <laughs> because in many, many places, uh, you can find socialists, socialist movements, socialist parties, then become populist. It's very common, but let me just start with what you just mentioned. He mentioned Ernesto Laclos, Chantal Mouffe. Uh, to me, they were Althusserian Marxists. I don't know uh, uh, if you actually did not accept their own claims about themselves at that time, but they wrote lots of books uh, from that, that perspective. So the turn to populism in their case is certainly uh, uh, from socialism of, of one kind or another, but it is not just them, it's also the French Communist Party which clearly turned uh, uh, populist and what's left of it now, which is, is France and uh, uh, Mélenchon's movement, is also, also populist. And you have this in, in lots of other places. I, I, I still would put a question mark next to Bernie Sanders, but I think the possibility that he too is a populist must have crossed your mind too. It right. certainly has crossed crossed mine. Uh, you say that embodiment is a populist thing, the socialist tradition is opposed to it. Well, the easiest way to argue against that is to say Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, Yosef uh, Vissarin uh, Stalin, uh, Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, uh, uh, Ceausescu, Enver Hoxha, Matyas Rakoshi. Every one of our countries had a boss. And indeed, uh, I, as a child, learned that Matyas Rakoshi was the Hungarian boy's best friend. I mean, you know, this is something that was so pervasive and powerful. And he was, a, certainly, uh, he was certainly a communist uh, from way back, as indeed all the other uh, people uh, uh, were as well. So embodiment uh, uh, in a leader is, 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 is unfortunately very much part of the history of the authoritarian version of the communist movement. Though there was a time when August Babel was a boss too, so even social democracy knows this, knows this version much less so. So I would say the point should be decided theoretically, not by these examples. And theoretically, my view is that 
uh, at a moment, historical moment, when one form of authoritarian uh, ideology becomes impossible, that's your argument about fascism, a populist substitute is sometimes generated, and there are lots of cases for that, but Argentina certainly is the best. At the moment when authoritarian state socialism becomes impossible, uh, the same is now true, and that's why you have populism in so many places, but I would say that at the moment when the classical version of it entered into crisis, uh, also populist alternatives have emerged. I mean, uh, once you need to shift from a philosophy of history with stages and with uh, uh, clear descriptions uh, of, uh, uh, of the transitions among them, once you have to get rid of all that, as Bolshevism has to, uh, the idea of producing some kind of substitute which actually explains how it is that in a country in which 10% are industrial workers, nevertheless you can have a Marxist revolution because the peasantry and the workers are part of the same people. Once you get to that, you have a populism. You can, if you work just with discourse, or primarily with discourse as the soul, you can read Lenin's writings and Mao's, certainly even with greater benefit, and discover exactly the same kind of populist discourse that you will find you will find elsewhere. Now, of course, there are elements of it which are different uh, to the extent uh, that uh, the history is still taken seriously, uh, that the social class is still uh, uh, an important category. There are differences, and I think that in that sense, Cass Mother's idea that populism needs host ideologies, I think, is, is worth, uh, worth saving. So in that sense, uh, uh, when uh, 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 Socialism is used as a host ideology, one can do uh, without those matters, and when socialism turns uh, uh, populist, it is forced to at least give up uh, some of its, some of its uh, components. I think the historical relationship between these two things is even more complex, much more complex than I even had in my article, which was assigned at the class, uh, because I think that the turn, the populist turn, occurs much sooner, uh, at least uh, in the uh, 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 Russian Marxist uh, uh, tradition, and probably if we knew enough, uh, we would say also in the Chinese Marxist uh, uh, tradition as well, and in all the, uh, the fellow traveling countries uh, uh, with large peasant populations, the turn, I would say, occurs early. In that sense, even earlier than parallelism. Of course, elements of, of the socialist doctrine will be kept, but what is not going to be missing is leadership, embodiment, part whole, fundamental antagonism, these will all be, all be present. So there will be an overlap. Let's call populism and socialism, let's, let's make a Venn diagram uh, of the two of them, two circles. These two circles will overlap over a, lo over a large range, but there will be elements in each which will, uh, which will not fit in the other tradition. Uh, democracy. Uh, I, uh, I, I like your solution, uh, Sol, uh, that it is on the most fundamental regime level where we're talking about also a society, a social form, that the fundamental difference in populism and democracy should be solved. Uh, and uh, this idea, uh, you're influenced by Claude Lefort, as, uh, as I am too, uh, translates uh, as uh, the notion uh, that uh, uh, in a uh, democratic regime, uh, the societal center is not occupied, the space of the king is not occupied. And clearly, from that point of view, populism is not democratic in that sense, because it is fundamental that the space of the king is occupied. Uh, and uh, in the name of, uh, uh, in the name of uh, an abstract entity that can never really act uh, on its own. And so, therefore, what uh, Federico just described, the idea that a leader uh, speaks for the people that he's or she, a more authentic uh, uh, version of the people than the, than the empirical people themselves, is an under, profoundly undemocratic idea. To this, this extent, on that level, I think that I completely agree that populism, the debate is a futile one because on the most fundamental level it's not a democratic trend. But where I disagree <coughs> is that you seem to suggest that on the level that political scientists speak about, populism can be perfectly democratic. And you say, I think it's a very formal idea, uh, that you will find elections, uh, you will find uh, uh, judiciaries, uh, you will find executives, you'll find legislatures, you'll find local government, 
And I think in every populist setting, uh, of course, uh, you will find these things. But of course, uh, and this is consistent with your, your other idea about the more fundamental meaning of the regime, can these things be the same in a populist setup? Especially once a full transition to a populist regime has occurred, which I would not say has occurred in the United States right now, as uh, lamentable is the place of, 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 of the Trump team in the government. Uh, but certainly, uh, 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 separation of powers, uh, uh, I think that in every version, including council communism, one must, have, one must see uh, that democracy imp imp must imply, uh, and this is the idea of the center of society not being occupied, must imply there are many powers whose relations are potentially conflictual, potentially cooperative, depending on the situation, but there's a multiplicity of them. Uh, once uh, 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 that, uh, uh, that is not there because uh, it is the same exact force uh, that uh, uh, has occupied the space of the executive, that controls the legislature, that has come to occupy uh, the judiciary, uh, that has uh, uh, managed to transform the structure of uh, the media, uh, and has even occupied local government through primarily top-down organizations. Uh, 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 to that extent, I think uh, 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 one can say that uh, the things exist in form. I mean, after all, coming from a state socialist country, we had elections too. We had judges too. We did have a legislature and certainly an executive branch. Uh, obviously, everyone of those here will know uh, that this is not the real thing, uh, because the Communist Party of each of the countries, and sometimes even of another country, the Soviet Union, controls all these branches. Well, to the extent uh, that the space of <coughs> uh, the empty space of the king has been occupied, every one of these things has been transformed. And I think the political scientists are right, uh, and they are trying to think of new names for it for that reason. Uh, competitive authoritarianism, illiberal democracy, I'm not sure there will be other terms, uh, but, but in order to actually describe uh, even the mechanics of these regimes, I think, don't think we should identify them uh, uh, with, uh, with democracy. Of course, because populism in government has not yet constructed a regime, there I think you still can speak about real elections. Turkey and Hungary just had real elections, at least in the capital cities, uh, and, um, and certainly uh, um, we can be no in, in Venezuela. After all, uh, the most important election that Chavez tried to win, which would have involved dramatic constitutional change of his own constitution, interestingly enough, he lost, uh, right? So even Venezuela, not now, but back then, still had some of the forms uh, of democracy. But I think once a regime is constructed, once that threshold is passed, and that I think is not true with Maduro, uh, you can't expect any elections to uh, uh, play, play the same kind of role. One issue, uh, and then I'll stop. Given the way that uh, Federico addressed the issue of socialism uh, by trying to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to say that populism is just something completely different and, and there's no overlap, real overlap between them, uh, we forgot one of the messages in a lot of the readings. Because I think uh, the readings by Madrid and, uh, and Lopez, uh, what is her full name? Uh, anyway, those two essays in particular uh, discuss, uh, the, con discuss uh, the matter empirically, and at least in their view, uh, uh, whether it is uh, Chavismo or uh, Morales' uh, Bolivia, uh, uh, they at least take the view uh, that lots of uh, uh, of institutional uh, tools, lots of institutional aspirations, which are traditional for the history of socialism, whether it is uh, 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 social policy and, uh, and redistribution, uh, whether it is uh, introducing some elements of participatory democracy, uh, whether it is uh, a question of uh, defending the integrity of the country against external uh, uh, imperialist uh, uh, interventions, uh, some elements of socialism are, are present there. So they, the authors, at least if you read, don't, at least two or two of them, don't have any doubts uh, uh, about that question. But, but then they actually, and this is, uh, I think, important for the class, uh, uh, at least those two authors uh, raised the question of what kind of socialism. Uh, 
and, and they focus on the economic policy, which they insist is heterodox, but not socialist, except in the case of Chavez, who starts a heterodox, a heterodox uh, left Keynesian phase, but who in the second administration declares 21st century socialism and aims at least at, uh, uh, at, a, uh, uh, at, at more substantive forms of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of socialist policy. I leave that to the side because I think probably no fair uh, interpreter would claim that whether, and this is especially true for, for Bolivia, uh, whether Bolivia or Venezuela uh, or Ecuador, and certainly not Argentina, has at any moment instituted uh, state socialism. Uh, but of course for the history of socialism, it's not only state socialism that matters, but also, uh, uh, also heterodox economic policy oriented to growth, oriented to redistribution, oriented to uh, equalization. And I think these elements you do find in the cases uh, 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 that are in front of us. And so I think when Saul says that Peronism is a substitute or at least a kind of functional replacement for socialism in a country where socialism has been weak, I interpret that in a sense of having adopted some dimensions of social democracy, not of state socialism. And I think on that level, I mean, I can't debate about Argentina, uh, but I would say that even Peronism in its classical phase uh, adopts things from, from social democracy historically, which don't make them social democrats of the Danish, in the Danish sense, uh, or, or a Swedish sense, but which indicate that, that, that that aspect of the identity is not just a claim, as you say, but there's an attempt to actually bring together the two parts of the Venn diagram, the socialist and the populist, in some sense. Now our problem, it will be, uh, but maybe not in this class, but in some future class, is does that mix work? And what are the negative, what are the negative effects of trying to marry socialism to populism? See, your, your argument is they can't be married, they're completely different. My argument is that there is an elective affinity between them, coming from both sides, but the marriage, unfortunately, has very bad consequences not so much for the populists, but for the socialists. Okay. Can I just... Sure, of course. Uh, the, I mean, in terms of, again, like I tend to see, and we have been discussing this with, in a very productive conversation, I think it's mm -hmm. not that we convince each other, but we have been right. talking a lot about this. Uh, and I see, as you know, I, I emphasize the, the distinctions, and I would just uh, like to mention a couple of them. Um, the, the one is that, like in, in populism, it's really, as fascism was before it, like a, it's really a, an anti-party movement, I mean movement, that it is a movement. Whereas in, in the socialist tradition, I mean, yes, in practice, I mean, again, like we should distinguish between practice and, and theory, but in theory, this is not really anti-party, I mean, this is not a movement, I mean, in a way, it's a party, and especially in the communist tradition. I mean, and the movement is the vehicle for the leader. The party is constituted as something different. And, and in a way, theoretically at, least, the, the, uh, theoretically at least, the legitimacy in the socialist tradition belongs to the party and the people, not to the leader. Whereas <coughs> this conflation is totally different in, in the populist tradition. Now, the question that you ask is whether, like more recently, these two traditions merge. Uh, I mean, you could say, well, in the Chavez case, he's claiming that. But I, I don't see it, frankly, like in the same way as I started with Franco claiming a democratic tradition for his dictatorship, and I see none, uh, only the speech of that. And, and the, the, the last thing I want to say is that in the case of Perón, I mean, what might, in a way, it's interesting because what might be an affinity with the social democratic elements, in his case, came from the corporatist, corporatist and the social Catholic tradition. I mean, that, I mean the, the, and this is the crazy dimension of the Pope now, that many people misunderstand the Pope as a leftist. Actually, that used to be an argument by the right. That you know that basically the state should redistribute. As Perón, Perón famously went to the stock market and, and said during a, the 1945 campaign, he said, "You don't understand. You believe I'm a revolutionary, but if we don't do this, the communists will do it, and it will be worse for us, you and me, the stock traders and me." And then he, the following day, he said he misspoke. That was not true, but he said that because he had this idea that, like the right, 
and needed to change the, stat the, the status quo, that that couldn't work, and they needed some redistribution and killing about the poor. But the, but the, idea, the idea is totally, um, in, in, a, in a way, is very conservative. And the interesting thing, of course, is that at the same time, in other regions of the world, similar practices were emerging, but perhaps with a different legitimacy, that, that, or let's say a different source of legitimacy or a different theory. That, that's, my, that, that's my argument. The, the, the New Deal might have looked similar, but in a way it was presented as coming out of a different tradition. Um, now, of course, people entering Peronism after 55, they wanted exactly to link both, and this is what they wanted. But my point is that they paid the high <coughs> price of not only recognizing the leader, but depending on the leader for their legitimacy. That's why it's so different from for Montoneros, one Perón ex famously expelled them from, for, from the plaza, because their own legitimacy was on the leader. And the problem was that the leader was still alive. They are, le le they are, they are, by the way, their slogan was Perón or death. And Perón said, you are young people that do not understand anything, get out and expel them from the plaza. Now, the last thing I want to say is, and this is interesting, that, I, that in a way, some theories of populism wrongly uh, present only the anti-democratic side. I mean, and in practice, I mean, you might, I mean, I, I take them seriously. It's an authoritarian populism, post-fascism, however you want to call it. There is a democratic side to it. This is not a dictatorship. Uh, and, uh, and the democratic side is, is not only the electoral dimension, which, uh, I mean, and actually you have really push me there by criticizing me, focusing on the electoral dimension, and I, and, I, and I try to check on other things after particularly your criticisms, is that in the case of Perón, and then you might wonder whether this is the case in other regimes, and I don't think it is, not even for the Kirchner's. I mean, in Perón, is the, the practice is that in that government, which was authoritarian in many ways, like if you work for the state, it was highly recommended that your children were part of the Peronist youth, if you are a professor in a university, you should be a member of the party, and so on and so on and so on. But, but, people that were poor were less poor in Argentina, and people that were rich, they were less rich after Peronism. So my point is that some Peronists actually participated of, of this, you know, uh, unknowingly or not participate, participating of this right-wing Catholic tradition, would say, who cares about formal democracy? People are living better, yes, accepting the leader. So what do you take? The messianic political theology or this? And that's a paradox, or that's the context, but that explains the agency of the, of the, of the, of the sources of support for, for parentism. It's not just that they follow this because of propaganda or the political theology itself, but that comes with the package. You want to be Jewish, be Jewish, but be Peronist. That comes with your identity. It changes your identity, and eventually it presents a model that is both democratic and authoritarian. Now, last thing I want to say is that analyzing Kirchnerism, certainly analyzing Chavism, you need to see the long picture. And you could say, yeah, Perón finished like that, they, you know, there was a coup d'etat, whatever. The long picture is that Perón in the first government really changed the, uh, you know, uh, the distribution of wealth, income inequality, as we say now, in Argentina. The Kirchner's is not, the, uh, or Chavez is not. They were in the long run, and I don't think you can easily blame only external sources for this. They created new bourgeoisies. They, as Santiago reminded me many times, they depended on, on very traditional extractivism to destroy the earth. Yeah. I mean, they, I mean, and eventually their economic problems were a failure, and they were explicitly based on mass consumption, meaning. The freedom that Adorno will criticize, the freedom to why. So now, in populism, you have the freedom to why. And that sort of freedom, I mean, is really not that different from previous versions of, of Peronism, such as neoliberalism. And then it kind of makes sense. They change sometimes the slogans, they change a couple of practices, but the same economic tradition, in a way, is different to the one that started with the Peronist model. So my point is, I, I don't know how different they are from previous uh, uh, governments, and in a way, I mean, seen from afar, they are not that different from Macri, who was this neoliberal president that, in a way, with different things, like, they kind of continue the same kind of economy in Argentina, depending on the export based on, on, on you know, a couple of products and uh, taking stuff from the air in order to support consumption of the capital. So, so... Well, yes, I have some things to add before you do the, the questions or the place to the questions. Um, well, in general, I mean, I agree with most of Federico's diagnostic in terms of um, seeing populism and in particular Peronism and Kirchnerism as a personalist 
uh, movement, I mean, regarding personalism, embodiment, uh, homogeneity, um, identification between the leader and the people, uh, and the movement aspect of populism. I mean, that, that is true, and maybe I wasn't, I wasn't clear about that, but of course that I, ha I, I think that um, we have to make a difference, or we have to try to, to make a difference and to distinguish or to see which are the democratic and the non-democratic aspects of those movements. But still, I think that I, 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 prefer, I prefer to have like a different epistemological uh, approach because I think that yet we have to understand it. I mean, not to judge it in a way, because uh, when, we, when you see Cristina's people or Peronistas, you really see that there is a, a popular affection there. I mean, it's not only manipulation, as you said before, or, 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 or only <coughs> propaganda. Yeah, that's yeah. I agree with you in that point. So, if you want to understand why that works and why that's the only way in which Argentina could fulfill some socialist uh, ideas, you have to, I mean, try to understand and 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 go uh, inside that. So uh, that's why I say that populism is a different thing, as you also said, it's different, it, it has a different um, feature than authoritarianism and than democracy, or at least the liberal democracy in a narrow sense of the term. Uh, and here I go with democracy. I mean, yes, of course that if we have, if we have a very narrow definition of democracy, well, we cannot distinguish. So I think that the aim of at least of, of intellectuals and of those who think about that is to to enlarge that definition of democracy. I mean to um, enlarge and to to think about a more emancipatory uh, concept of democracy in order not to um, give up on that concept on behalf of. of other concepts which could be more confusing. You know? So I think that there is an, an epistemological uh, approach here which is important to claim. And it's not that I'm not, uh, I, I mean, I also have some um, problems with populism, as you, as you do, I mean, but I mean, I cannot give up on understanding it and on fighting for other conceptions of democracy. So it's, mine is more like an intellectual debate, you know, with, for example, MOVE or all the authors that also tend to confuse populism and democracy. <coughs> so, and then you, uh, Andrew talked about Maduro. I think that the case of Chavism. I mean, we had that confusion, and we could have that confusion during uh, Chavez period. But then, with Maduro, I think that it becomes more, more clear that uh, there is a transition from populism to a more uh, authoritarian. <coughs> that, that is clear that there is authoritarianism. I mean, even the political scientists put them outside democracy because there is there are not even the the, the least um, democratic features or rules working. So. Well, that, that's it for now. But you can find plenty of undemocratic practice in the Chavez himself. Well, yeah. To elect a constituent assembly with over 90% through that kind of electoral sure, rule, sure. to lose a referendum and then enact half those things by uh, 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 congressional uh, decision, of course, there's plenty of undemocratic features. Packing the courts uh, uh, and uh, reducing the independence of, uh, of the judiciary. Keeping a constituent assembly in place uh, uh, long after the constitution is written, uh, many many things like that, which are really undemocratic. Mm -hmm. So with Maduro, you finally have it. Uh, no one has any doubts. Mm -hmm. But the undemocratic governmental aspects of it show up, uh, and and even for a more attractive thing like Morales, they show up. Uh, you lose the referendum on uh, on the re-eligibility. Uh, so you uh, go to a court which you yourself have packed, and the court says it's a human right for you to be able to run for election again. What kind of human right is that? 
right? That means that Trump now, after his second term, can claim that it is his human right to run for a third, right? And that's the very nice Morales who does it. By the way, in Morales' case, the leftist origins are in no doubt at all. This is always a left-wing uh, socialist movement, right? So that, that it has come from the left, uh, in that particular case, is not... Okay, uh, I should watch it. Uh, are you done, or...? Yeah. yeah. So let's, maybe, because we're running out of time, and we have a lot of experts here who are experts because of their uh, historical experience, probably many of them. Let's have about three questions at a time, and then the two of you answer, I'll stay out. The three of us. No, 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 because it's, uh, it's, it's <coughs> running out of time, and we, uh, we're all following Argentinian uh, <laughs> ideas of time here. <laughs>
Uh, well, it all depends on the definition of, pop of populism, mm -hmm. but uh, if you don't think of populism as, a stri as strictly as a, a way of leadership or, or a style, if you think it as a, a, a way of appealing and of constructing frontiers, it's, it's different from the, the new wave of populism, I think. And the third thing, regarding the, the economic policies of, of Kirchnerism, which is not my, my subject, but the only thing I can say is that um, it is true, it, it, was, it, it didn't get out of neoliberalism uh, because, um, I mean, there was a capitalist model in Argentina, but I think that Kirchnerism tried, tried to impose a different model of development. I mean, by, for example, stressing the national, um, the national business or the national industry. Uh, of course, that the result was not very good because, as he, as, as he said, well, in Argentina, uh, as, as Mujica said, we created consumers, not citizens, he said. I mean, the freedom to buy was the main, finally, the main value that remained after those distributive policies and maybe it's not enough, I mean, but there, there was the idea of transforming the economic model into a more domestic industry and everything. It failed, but that, that's the only thing that I could say about the economics during Kirchnerism. Yeah, I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, I would not argue against what I argued before. I mean, in my own book, I have a section on neoliberalism and populism, and, and I see that there is a clear connection. What is interesting about Menem, as opposed to my memory of it, in fact, I mean, I saw also in my in my memory, I, I had like this idea of a, just a, you know a, a crook that, that wanted to you know just to do what what others did before him, combine corruption, clientelism, and, and you know. Uh, and, and follow what is what was involved in the world at the time, but if you read Menem's speeches after the campaign, trying to justify the logic of the market, he talks about this as him impersonating the people and this being what the people want. And in fact, he even said, "This is what these are different times, and this is what General Perón would have done if he was alive." I'm doing what. So basically, you might. My point is that I have no argument with that. I don't need to defend Peronism for whatever legacy. So Peronism was in constant reformulation, and in the 1990s that was Peronism. So the point is that would Peron, I have no clue what Peron would have done. Certainly that was not what Peron did. Uh, but certainly what the Kirchner did was not what Peron did, and they all claim different legacies. So it's a politics of memory in a way. But Peronism, I mean, I don't think Peronism ceased to be populist during the many years. And again, the same characters. I mean, the Kirchner also participated of that. And, uh, and actually supported the privatization of the state, uh, oil state company, which eventually first they semi, you know, privatized by giving giving a, a, qui a quite a lot, quite a long part of it to some friends in the south. And eventually, when these friends decided, I mean, this was interesting, by the way, that like uh, the company was privatized by many that belonged to Spain, and when Nestor Kirchner becomes the president. Out of their goodwill, apparently the Spaniards decided to give like a big chunk of the company to this very unknown family from the same province that Nestor Kirchner came from, a friend of his, of course. Uh, some people say presta nombre. Uh, I mean, uh, and so on. But the point is that this is part of the traditional Argentine politics, and I don't think that it changed much. I think if we take a kind of, you know, what really changed in Argentina, I mean, the levels of poverty, I don't think, you know, we need to take the, the, the long picture here. Like, we cannot. The, you know, analyze politics in two years. But when they started and when they finished, I mean, this was this was a huge economic mismanagement, huge level of corruption as they were before, and they happened later, by the way. Macri didn't change anything. They continue with the same kind of, uh, you know, creating their own or supporting their own bourgeois sectors. So what is interesting is that, I mean, again, we can focus on different things and, and we see what, what, I mean, a couple of things changed, but many others did not, uh, and in a way, Ironically, I think the Perón regime of 1946 was much more revolutionary than what these, uh, what these uh, politicians did in the 1990s and again in the 2000s. And again, what would be interesting to see is what goes on now. Now, what is interesting is that back then, in the 2000s, 
as it is the case now. I mean, even to the extent that, I mean, that, that we might say, yeah, this was a government of the left, what left? What kind of left engages in, you know, political parts with feudal lords in different provinces which is a level of exploitation which is not the one that you see in Buenos Aires, a level of repression of native populations which is which never changes, it didn't change with Macri, it didn't change with the Kirchners. So my, my point is that we see a, a kind of coalition pact between, which is typical, between now perhaps uh, leading from the left with you know really repressive feudal actors uh, from you know, from different provinces, uh, participating of the government, supporting it, given, I mean, actually in the current government they were given important positions. Uh, and then you, you wonder exactly whether, I mean, what really changed and whether, I mean, and, you know, people that follow Kirchnerismo, they, they have this, uh, this Argentine phrase, like, we need to eat some, you know, some frogs in order to... But the point is, like, really these are just frogs that you eat, or is this is a change, I mean, no much change, and some, you know, some nice things that many of us agree with. So, because the point is, like, I mean, certainly you will not see change if you, if you are, let's say, uh, you know, if you are living in Chaco, or if you are living in Jujuy, or other provinces, where, I mean, if you are, let's say, of native origin. Uh, I mean, and that didn't change much. That didn't change much. Yes, if you were in Buenos Aires, uh, things may have changed. I mean, depending on your you know, of your income, they may have changed with Macri or they may have changed with the Kirchners, but there are people that suffer that their lives never change. So my point is like, I mean, I, I don't live in Argentina, I see it from here, and I see the same country, and I, say, I see the same politicians moving from Menem to the Kirchner to Macri or whatever, and I see the same kind of uh, a participation. I mean, creation of bourgeoisie, high levels of corruption that remain, uh, and again, for me, this is not a small matter like having a mother or a father as our leader. And this continues. I mean, even Macri tried to return to this, le to, this to some elements of this uh, neoliberal populism. Uh, anyway, so I, I don't see much, I mean, again, like it, to me, what I see is, is, uh, is populism. And then if uh, uh, Cass is right, then you see different, you know, different guests in the model. I mean, different, different slogans, or that, perhaps even ideologies in the model, but and, and some important changes, of course, depending on who you are and where you live. Uh, just on, on one question on India, which actually is linked to the issue of neoliberalism. I mean, uh, uh, just to start on, on that end, uh, I, I think your remarks were probably influenced by Gino Germani's book on, on, on uh, populism and fascism, which actually has this very strong stress on modernization crises and a populist response to it. And historically, in one particular period, that worked, but of course we're not in that period, and people who reject modernization theory don't want to revive this theory. But there is one element uh, which is relevant in it, is that, that phenomena which are larger and bigger than that of a single country uh, matter, and then secondly, that crises matter. So, so influence of uh, whether it is the world economic system, teaching Wallerstein in the other class, or whether it is actually the influence of world cultural political relations, which I think is more relevant to your fascism thesis, because you, why could you not be a fascist after the Second World War? Because uh, uh, unless you were part of the Soviet sphere of influence, uh, you had to have a governmental structure which imitated those of the Hegemonic, uh, uh, hegemonic democracies, the United States, England, eventually France, and now the European Union. Uh, but of course, there's such an influence of the economy too. And that actually me makes the argument uh, of Gino Germani a little bit obsolete now, because he was thinking of import substitution models being adopted, right? That was the way he, that was really his his argument, right, that there's a crisis uh, of, uh, uh, of the open market, world market, in which at that time these countries uh, were all part of, and the response to that is, and this was a serious theory which kind of worked even for a while, uh, more closure, uh, more protection, substitution for imports uh, would, be, would be the answer. But now at the current stage of globalization, whatever Trump and his team think, this particular method is not, not likely to work. We can see China, right, going the other way, and that affects populism. 
And so you have neoliberal versions of populism which you did not have before. I think in that sense, Menem and Fujimori do fall in. Color de Menem. And, and Color falls in. And Modi falls in. And Erdogan falls in. Because these are very populist leaders in terms of the way you and I would define the term. But nevertheless, the economic policy you see emerging from them is not what used to be called populist economics. Because that was a term. Populist economics was, uh, was protectionist. Uh, it was oriented to huge amount of spending and was uh, not concerned with the inflation as a primary problem, but more with unemployment and issues like that. But today you can't do that. And so that's why I was struck by the articles we are reading that the two of them assigned uh, for this session, is that they all say that uh, even the left ideologies uh, on the populist side tend to choose uh, heterodox economic policies rather than, uh, rather than directly socialist ones. I didn't notice so much about Morales, and, but I did uh, realize that Chavez had uh, two, uh, two phases. Uh, so even the ones who are not uh, uh, ideologically exclusionary, uh, who are not uh, 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 authoritarian in the right-wing sense, nevertheless, uh, uh, the version of, uh, of the left that they'll be attracted to uh, is going to be uh, a kind of uh, heterodox uh, Keynesian uh, uh, interventionist, uh, but at the same time certainly very little expropriation, basically, in spite of all the authors point to expropriations in other countries, relatively speaking, it's not, you know, for if, when I come, from where I come from, uh, this is not serious expropriation, but there is expropriation, but there's also privatization, uh, by all of them too, reprivatization. So in that sense, uh, 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 there's a kind of convergence, which is because of the world, <coughs> context in which everyone, everyone operates, and that uh, also means populism is different than it was, but it doesn't mean that we should think of, of it as the right answer, because a lot of my friends would think that the answer uh, to, uh, to uh, the, the international pressures uh, from coming from the world economic system are populist answers. Well, that's what Bernie Sanders thinks. But, you know, uh, we've seen things like that, well, for example, Mitterrand's first administration, one or two years they were able to buck uh, the, uh, uh, the context in which uh, uh, France was operating. But you have to, you have to retreat. Uh, I like Elizabeth, Sanders, uh, Elizabeth Warren, <laughs> Elizabeth Warren uh, much more because she, had, she has the capability of doing that. In the case of once you run into roadblocks, uh, how actually do you manage anyway? Uh, but I think in the problem with Bernie Sanders is that he has shown himself totally, totally unable uh, to adapt himself to anything, including even the party within which he has to win. He might win anyway because of, not you guys, because no one here is from the U.S., maybe you, maybe you are, <laughs> but their generation is going to put him through, but that's going to be a going to be exactly the same kind of problem that populist leaders run into a lot of countries, is that the policy is not going to work, he's going to run into the separation of powers. But, 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 but do you see, because I mean, I do not see Warren or Sanders as populist, because I don't, I don't see, see her as populist at all. Right, because right. I don't see embodiment. But that's see, where, the, you know, it's a very thin line, right, right. between yeah, Warren but, and Sanders. Yes, but, but neither of them I see as embodying, uh, you know, saying like I, I speak in the name of the people. Just wait, just wait. But I'm talking about what I see. Now the other going. Well, I'm going to vote Argentina, for him because of the choice. But uh, so it's not a problem on that level. The, the question is for Argentina. Like I mean, uh, I I wouldn't like uh, replicate much the American left with the Argentine. Like, I mean, uh, so for example, correct me if I'm wrong, the Argentines here, like, I don't know exactly what happened with this case, but basically one of the major supporters of the, of the Kirchner's was this kind of sort of feudal lord from the north, now a senator, was accused by a close relative of having raped her. I, I, I mean, I never, I mean, like, the, as the president of the Senate, Christina Kirchner said nothing about it, as far as I know. And, uh, and he, he, is he back? Well, is he back? I mean, he's back, right? Or, or he's in a license. But, but the point is that this will be an acceptable for the American left. And yes, for the Argentine, you know, for the for wow. Kirchnerism, is he out? Is he out? I mean, this is a serious accusation of, 
of a I'm talking about Alperovich. Like he used to be this feudal kind of governor in a very poor northern province, extractivism here being a key word. Uh, and now a senator, he's seriously accused of death by a red close relative. And as far as I know, I didn't hear anyone from the major voices of, of, the, of Kirchnerism kind of uh, participating of what is a concern in other lefts, including the Argentine left, the non peronist left. So, again, I will, you know, there are some distinctions which are part of this more paternalistic tradition, I would say. We have time for um, another round. Oh, yeah, I'm right. to answer Julia because she raised a question about the continuity between classic Peronism and Kirchnerism. That was your question. I, I think that you are right that we cannot put them all together in the same um, under the same label because but the, how to how to do the differentiation? I think that populism is always about a, a reading or an interpretation of the past. You know, like a rejected past that you, you want to overcome. So maybe you're right in the, in the point that the difference between, for example, the new populism in Argentina and the, old, the, the older one is that the enemy or the past to be over, <coughs> overcome, overcame in the 50s was communism or was the, the threat of communism, while in the, after the democratic transition, the enemy is, um, I mean, what you have to gain is democracy, or the idea is that populism is a trigger to democratize you know, and to left behind authoritarianism. So with, there with are the two, two different elements. You mean with the Kishnas? With the Kishnas, yeah. And regarding, so you have the frontiers, the enemies, and then you have the the, um, the coalitions or the us, and that you can there you can see a difference also because you can see the difference between Menemism and Kishnerism in that sense because the coalition under Menemism was more likely the Macrist coalition. I mean, it it was in terms of O'Donnell, it was a coalition with the international capital with um, the rural sectors, I mean the ones that take the dollar, you know, in terms of, in economic terms. And in Kirchnerism, the alliance was with the national industry, it tried to be, and with the low class, and the rurals always pendulate, as O'Donnell said, you know. But I think that by by observing coalitions and frontiers, you can uh, we can see more um, uh, sub, uh, more subtleties and nuances between different moments. Well, I don't see like this kind of uh, different triggers. I mean, you can have. I mean, the history of the of populism shows that it comes in all tastes and, and you know and variety. So, I mean, they, they, if you think about the Peronist model, of course, unions are central. Uh, unions, by the way, that are, I mean, that are also very malleable in the sense that you know during many missions the union supported as well. Like, uh, and he was able to, you know, to to really somehow put them behind. I mean, they were doing strikes, you know, many of them during the previous government and suddenly when there was a further neoliberal, you know, measures being taken, it was kind of a more accepted than in the past. And it took some time, and, you know, for other unions to, I mean, from some dissidents within the unions to, to criticize that. Now, the point is, like, in other cases, I mean, you don't have much of that. And I don't, I mean, again, like, probably you are, I mean, you are providing the best answer by emphasizing what is peculiar about Salvador and see how this particular way of doing politics is being, you know, presented there rather than, I mean, you know, at least historically, I would say, I, you know, I don't, I don't follow this kind of uh, uh, different formulas in order to see where it, where it, I mean, my, you know, I want to see what's going on and then let's try to build from there, I mean. Uh, and the last thing I want to say, I mean, about yeah. you know the future, I guess, is that I'm an historian, I'm an expert on the past, I have no clue. Okay. Now, the point is that whether we 
PC, I mean, whether we can see, let's say, forms of democracy which are not requiring us to engage in what Gramsci said was an article of faith, or not to engage in, you know, in people with, in leaders without programs, and, and you know, this is the kind of question that I, there's an open question for not only for Latin America, but I think a global question, like whether against a populism of the right we need a, a populism of the left, whether we need a, against father we need mother, or against big brother we need, you know, also another big brother or sister or whatever. So the point is that. Uh, to me, that is the question, and, and again, I mean, I mean, Emma just mentioned cases, I mean, which uh, which are not related to populist logic, and you know, they won and they lost elections, and in some cases, actually, they were tough, as in the case of Brazil, with you know, with the outcome of you know, we see a populism which is the closest to fascism that I have ever seen, which is Bolsonaro. Um, so again, I mean, and the, and the paradox, perhaps. Like uh, I don't, I don't think it's a Latin American paradox, but it's the paradox of, I guess, Argentina and as always Uruguay. Uh, but Argentina, at this moment, you have, if this, uh, you know, you have a Peronist coalition which is quite moderate, and in a way, if you think about the person that has been defeated, which is this neoliberal president Macri, uh, he was not Bolsonaro. And he was not a dictator, as, as sometimes you know some sectors of Kirchnerismo would say. He was a neoliberal, you know, a neoliberal uh, member of the elite, uh, a millionaire, uh, and so on and so forth. That ruled for for his group with the electoral conse consequences that you might expect. I mean, at least you might expect in a country like Argentina, because here, I mean. We see a similar situation, and perhaps this will be rewarded by votes. In Argentina, it doesn't work. It didn't work. But then Macri was not Bolsonaro, and in a way, Fernandez was not even, certainly was no Chavez, and certainly not even Cristina Kirchner. So the point that like, we see a kind of very moderate uh, situation in Argentina, I mean, I don't think it is an ideal situation, but it is, as, I guess, calmer than it has ever been in Argentina, and certainly calmer than many other countries in the region or the world. So I, I don't, I'm not saying this is the model, but it's strange to see this uh, in Argentina at this point. Like basically elections between moderates on the right and moderates on the left. And, and so far, uh, you know, some dialogue going on, so far. Yes, I, my answer will be very short. I, I will answer to both of you. I'm not optimistic because of moderation. I mean, I think that we managed uh, to avoid the Bolsonaro term in Argentina, at least now. And by moderation, I mean the, con the um, contention of anger. Because I wasn't clear, maybe, but I think that anger paralyzes. I, I thank you for the fun and reference. I, I didn't have, any, have it in mind, but I think that anger try, tends to paralyze, to rigidize politics, to depoliticize. So, uh, for me, it's like a very good news to know that uh, anger is trying to be reconducted to other paths, mo more democratic paths. But we'll see. So, as far as that question, because how can anybody uh, not answer that? Uh, I think, in spite of my opposition to populist politics, that populist politicians can learn. It's possible to learn. You see this with Podemos already in Spain, and I think that you probably see it with the Kirchners now, uh, or rather the new president. I mean, uh, populism is, uh, is, is in a way uh, a temptation for politics as long as you have crises and deficits of, of democracy and dem deficits of welfare. Uh, so I don't think we're going to argue populism away or to get rid of it uh, just because we show that it has really dangerous possibilities. Uh, but then the issue is learning, whether populists who are aware populists are capable of, of learning. And by learning I don't mean adapting to the neoliberal world order, but rather to oppose it effectively without ruining their economies and imprisoning their political opponents. That's the question. And I think this, should, this is a soluble, this question can be solved. Morales was on the borderline of this learning because he was confronted with uh, possibility of shifting to his party as carrying on the burdens that he himself previously assumed. And he chose not to learn. 
uh, which of course led to very bad outcome. But it doesn't mean that the next person who wins uh, uh, under the flag of a party like Maas or some other populist group, Vede Podemos, uh, when in power, uh, they have to kind of think about the option, whether the option is governing well uh, or making incumbency unable to lose. And, and if you overcome that temptation, that only you can do it, only the current incumbents can actually continue uh, uh, reform and uh, democratize, uh, then you lost. And you can see that temptation with Perón over and over again. I mean, he thought, of course, that if, uh, uh, if, if, if his wife uh, takes uh, over for him, that's still the same as if he, he continued himself. But he certainly believed that only he could do it. And Chavez actually often said so. And now Trump says so. This is, this is the, it's not only the question of embodiment, it's also the assumption that only you can actually do the job that is in front of you. And it's, it's, it's false. There's no one like that. And I think that that lesson could be learned also by, by, uh, by people who are now, for one reason or another, uh, classable as populists. Uh, and, you know, uh, Ben Ali certainly thought, right? then only he could do it. Yeah. And it turns out to be false, right? He, uh, you still have uh, 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 a, you know, a political system, social system that can be probably criticized in Tunisia on all kinds of grounds, uh, but it is certainly no worse than under Ben Ali, also economically. It does, he was not needed. And, and that illusion is, is the first thing that populists have to learn. It's maybe the hardest because embodiment implies that, that you can't think that way. Uh, but, but why not? I mean, that's the, uh, uh, the historical lesson that you don't have to be a professional historian to learn that no one is indispensable. Even at the new school. <laughs> <laughs>